Welcome to All About Campion, an introduction to loving the films of Jane Campion. I'm Ingo Kang, a critic at the Washington Post, and with me is my co-host Daniel Schrader, a podcast producer at Slate. Hey, Ingo! Happy to be here as always. As you may already know, this is the second season of our podcast. Our first was called All About Almodovar. About the films of Spanish author Pedro Almodovar. You don't need to go back and listen to the first season, unless you want to revisit or get to know the essentials of one of the greatest directors working today. And of course, highly recommend that best director ever.、Uh, <laughs> the format of that season was Ingu, a longtime Almodovar fan, sharing some of her favorite films with me, a dummy ass dumpster who <laughs> didn't really know his work. This season, we're slightly switching things up. Ingu is not the world's biggest expert on Jane Campion. Nope. And I have seen at least one of her works: the first season of Top of the Lake. Campion is a director whose filmography I have long wanted to catch up on. The Piano, her most famous and acclaimed work, which we will be talking about in this episode, is the kind of movie I first saw as a teenager. And have thought about on and off ever since. Because of Harvey Keitel's dick, right? <laughs> and with her first movie in twelve years, *The Power of the Dog*, coming out in a few weeks, we thought this would be a great time to delve together into Jane Campion, arguably the most celebrated female director of our time, if not the history of cinema. With all about Campion, we are planning on discussing all of our theatrical releases and both seasons of Top of the Lake. And we've got some special guests lined up that we're really excited about. I'm excited for us to get into the piano, but let's get some basics out of the way first. Campion is not the most prolific director. She has made eight features since she launched her career in 1989. In the same period, Almodovar made twice as many films. She has taken long breaks between several films, once for four years to homeschool her daughter, actress Alice Englert. You get the sense that she is not the kind of artist who produces for the sake of producing. Almodovar wouldn't know what that's like. <laughs> Looking at you, high heels. <laughs> The Piano is Campion's third film, and the one that put her on the international art house map. It made her the first woman director to win the Palme d'Or, the most prestigious prize at Cannes, the most prestigious film festival in the world. Though it did share the prize with Farewell My Concubine, another film about sexual repression and unrepression that I think you would love, Daniel. Putting it on the list. The piano also made Campion the second woman ever nominated for Best Director, though she lost to Steven Spielberg for Schindler's List. Not putting it on the list. <laughs> Sadly, Campion has said she couldn't really enjoy any of the accolades and success that came with the piano. Soon after the Palme d'Or win, she gave birth to a son who only lived twelve days. Oof. She did win the Best Original Screenplay Oscar for her script, Holly Hunter the Best Actress Award, and a then eleven-year-old Anna Paquin for Best Supporting Actress, making her the second youngest winner in that category. Was it deserved, though? <laughs> we'll get into it.、Uh, we will discuss. The piano was also nominated for Best Picture, Cinematography, Editing, and Costume Design. But surprisingly, not for its Michael Nyman score, as crucial to the film as the actors or the beautiful yet forbidding New Zealand landscape. A Bronte-inspired Gothic romance set in mid-nineteenth century New Zealand amid colonization. The Piano came out in 1993. To situate that, that seven years after Holly Hunter and Broadcast News put that on the list, Daniel, and one year. Before another landmark New Zealand film about unruly young women, Peter Jackson's *Heavenly Creatures*. Ugh, what a delight! I think I saw the piano as a high schooler because I took piano lessons then, and I knew it was a famous movie. Daniel, did you have any impressions of the piano before you saw it? None. No thoughts at all. Never heard of it. <laughs> If I had heard of it, I would have. I'm sure I just thought, "Oh, that's a drama." Bye. Not a single、it. thought in that blonde head of yours. There never was. There never will be. 
<laughs> and you say you're like not it. an LA person. <laughs> So, uh, tell me what happens to the piano, and uh, if you out there, the listener, have not seen the piano, uh, go watch it, and then come back and listen to the rest of this episode. Um, that's your spoiler warning. Truly, it was such a dream to watch it, not knowing anything about it the first time. So, like, if you haven't seen it, go do that now. And also, there's so many, like, interesting twists and turns that you do not want spoiled for you. But now I will spoil it. So, the piano is the story of Ada McGrath, played by Holly Hunter, a mute Scottish woman who is married off to Alistair Stewart, played by Sam Neill, a frontiersman in New Zealand. She and her daughter Flora, the young Anna Paquin, travel across the world with her piano to start their new life. When she arrives, her husband forces her to abandon said piano on the beach because it is too heavy for the men to carry back. She then encounters George Baines, played by smoke show Harvey Keitel, a friend of Alistair's who has adopted Maori customs. We're going to have to talk about those face tattoos at some point. Baines makes a deal with Alistair to buy the piano in exchange for, I think, like 80 acres of land um, nearby. And this is without Ada's consent or knowledge. And so her piano is sold off without her knowing. She begins to frequent his home to play the piano and supposedly teach him how to play, but he is much more interested in exchanging the piano for her body. And so over the course of the next few weeks, months, I don't really know, she and he develop a more and more intimate relationship as he slowly sells the piano back to her key by key. After Baines and Ada lay together naked for the first time, Baines clearly realizes his affection for her and that he no longer wants to continue this relationship in this way because it makes him feel disgusting and also disgusted that he is making her do this, uh, is basically whoring herself out for the piano. So he returns it to her as a gift. But then she still returns to Baines afterward to continue their intimate relationship. Her husband, Alistair, discovers this betrayal, and Alistair locks her and her daughter away until one day Ada learns that Baines is soon leaving for England. So she gives her daughter a piano key with an inscription of love for her to deliver to Baines, but Flora being a bitch, instead (laughs) brings the key to her new father, uh, concerned that Ada is doing something wrong. And when he realizes that Ada never stopped loving Baines, he chops her finger off to prevent further piano playing. This utterly destroys her and severs any connection Alistair had hoped to rebuild. So she ends up boarding a canoe with Baines, her daughter, and her piano to start yet another new life. At sea, she demands the piano be thrown overboard and slips her foot around the piano's rope so she's pulled under the water along with it, but decides she'd rather continue living even with her damaged hand than let the sea take her. We end on Ada playing the piano with a new metal finger crafted by Baines and her first attempts at learning how to speak. So what'd you think? I absolutely love this movie i am so happy i watched it i've now watched it twice i watched it yesterday with you and then i watched it again this morning and i just lost myself in it both times it is so much richer than i ever could have imagined and also i got to see a naked harvey Keitel. <laughs> Here's the thing. I was so worried that you would turn on Campion because no one is as horny as Pedro Almodovar. I mean, like, not technically true, but, like, that really... I was really worried that, like, you would lose interest because I was like, oh, no, I don't think these movies are going to be horny enough for Daniel. So that's why you chose this horny one. (laughs) So when you got on board with Harvey Keitel, I was very relieved. I mean, that 53-year-old man has an ass I currently dream of as a 32-year-old. So, like, if I can look that good at 53, please, God. 
Well, uh, keep doing those squats. Yes, I'll get right on it. Sorry. But (laughs) it was just a really great experience. I I don't know. I, I just really loved it. It was perfect. I think the movie that I kept coming back to while watching this was Portrait of a Lady on Fire. One of my very favorite movies, uh, like, in the last 10 years. Um, and I think, like, one of the things that, like, both of those movies have in common is that they're both about these, like, hidden spaces that, like, women are able to carve out, especially creative women are able to, like, carve out sort of, like, within the confines of marriage and of patriarchal society, and I think, the, like, one of the things I really love about, I love about this movie is that it's so much about sort of this, like, hidden inner life that Ada has to create, in large part with her daughter, that other people are not able to access. She is very open about the fact that, like, she is going to do things her way and other people are not going to be excluded. And she often sort of throws that intimacy in other people's faces. I really love the fact that like there are all of these ways that like Ada is able to like carve out pieces of a life for herself. And of course, when that gets disrupted, it's quite tragic. But that is like what I really loved about this film. Well, and that she has so much in her life that she um, it seems in some ways she has no space for Sam Neill like yeah but at the same time he doesn't seem to have space for her for him it seems like he treats her as just like oh well I've checked the marriage box I now have a wife and that's done and so even though you just said that like they're not able to be intimate because she and her daughter sleep in the same room at the same time he doesn't seem very desperate to be intimate with her He's so much more focused on the, like, concrete growth of his empire or whatever it will be than in, like, intimacy and love that, like, is actually important to a relationship and to, like, life. Yeah, he marries her, um, I think, probably, like, based on a picture. Yeah. And he makes the arrangement with her father, who does not have seemed to give Ada a choice. We know that at some point, Ada decided that she was going to assert her will by having her daughter out of wedlock, I think we're meant to assume. And uh, so much of her life is about uh, trying to make, like, the the few choices that she can in this, like, incredibly repressed world. And I really love these, like, little reveals that uh, Jane Campion does of just sort of, like, both the absurdity and the incredible intimacy of Ada's world. Like, I think every time you look under her skirt you see like the ridiculousness of like the hoop like structuring it and like ballooning up the skirt and I think there's a point at which uh she has a table that she has also brought from her from Scotland that is carved out to look like piano keys and she is sort of like practicing quote unquote on it and Sam Neill's character just cannot conceive of like what a woman's creativity is supposed to mean he finds her so peculiar, he thinks that she's, like, touched or troubled. Yeah, and I think it's very funny that, like, Holly Hunter's extremely short height is also <laughs> written into the script. Um, and he says, like, oh, I think she's stunted in both senses of the word. And so he can really only see her as, like, either meeting his own criteria for a wife or defective in some way. And Harvey Keitel's character is able to actually appreciate her creativity and not just that, but like desire her for it. And I think that that comes through in the first time that Harvey Keitel hears her play the piano on the beach when she demands that he take her back to the beach for the piano. And she just spends the entire day playing and playing and playing. And it's the first time in the film that we see her smile. We see her just fully happy because her fingers are touching those piano keys. And he understands that. Harvey Keitel understands that in a way that Sam Neill never can conceive of. Yes, he's very Mr. Business. I have to say, one of 
Jane Campy's degrees before film school was in painting. And I love the painterliness of this film so much. Like all of those scenes with like the piano on the beach at sunset with like the waves coming in and out. When she's on the cliff looking down at the piano. Yes. Like all of it was like very like like Cape Bush Wuthering Heights. It was all like mad woman with like long hair and a lacy nightgown twirling around in the fields. Like it is like very much like that type of femininity. But I think in a way that like doesn't feel cheesy. Um it's not like sort of like Enya vibes. <laughs> no, there's it's much more twinged with melancholy. Yeah, and like the I just I I don't even know if I have anything else to say about it. Like, I just, like, love, like, the unabashed romance of uh, that image of, like, the piano on the beach. Yeah, there's something about it that even so early in the film, I guess maybe partially because the film is named The Piano, but also because of Holly Hunter's, like, failed demands for it to be brought back. We already have such a like deep understanding of how important it is to her that those moments already feel important as opposed to cheesy, as opposed to corny in some way. It's it's not a romantic shot for the romantic shot of it all. It's for a greater purpose than that. And that's why it works. Yeah, I think just like the sheer fantasticalness of this piano lying abandoned on the beach has so much more of like that expressiveness of what that expressiveness is supposed to mean for that character and everything that she is losing by having the piano abandoned on the beach. Yeah. And I'm also reminded of uh, what you said earlier about Jane Campy and, and her mother's relationship. And also the moment later in the film when she attempts suicide Putting the piano on the beach like that, where the ocean is so often a metaphor for suicide and for like forces greater than ourselves that we can't control that do drive us to these things. And that that piano stands as this emotional anchor for her that keeps her from falling into that abyss and keeps her from um, losing herself. I have to say, I love, like, the ellipses in this movie. We don't really find out who Flora, the little girl played by Anna Paquin, we don't know who her father really is. We don't really know her history. Yeah, we just hear, like, fantastical stories. Yeah, we don't really get a sense of Ada's history with the piano. Uh, We do learn that around the age of six, she stopped talking, so she's not physiologically mute. And I really love that we don't really get answers for these things. I think part of it is because um, so much of her life when she comes to New Zealand is about having to deal with like the day-to-day realities of this new life that like she's suddenly been thrust into. And the big tension of this movie is that she is that there are all of these demands for her to be a more practical kind of person. But she is not a practical person. She would probably, like, in real life, drive you insane. Because she is, like, a whimsical, like, fantastical, capricious person who is going to do things her way or no way. And the fact that, like, she's clawing out a way for herself in this new life to remain the fantastical person that she wants to be. I don't know. Like, yikes. Like, what is more relatable? (laughs) Seriously. And I think, granted, you got to take all of the, like, personal backstory details with a grain of salt, but we're told that she went mute at the age of six in voiceover at the beginning of the film from Ada's character. Uh, But then also, I think later in the film... One of the characters, maybe it was Sam Neill, said that she started playing the piano at five or six. And so there's possibly a connection to be made of like, she stopped speaking when she finally found her voice, and her voice is the piano. Yeah, this is one of those things where I'm glad it was not underlined and boldface and circled. Right. The only thing that was underlined in this film was when she said, the piano is mine. It's mine. (laughs) 
I think that the other thing that I really love about this movie is that so much about the movie is about like how dangerous it sort of is to not grapple with like the outside realities of being like a woman who is trying to like hold on to I don't know kind of these like sand castles that she's created for herself she imbues um her daughter also with these like really fanciful ideas about romance um there's a story that she has she has apparently told her daughter about like what happened with her and the flora's father and the little girl repeats this like incredibly (laughs) ridiculous story about like how ada and her baby daddy i guess uh were out in a storm and they were singing and that like the climax of like the duet they were singing they were both struck by lightning and he died and she never spoke again and it both speaks to like the grand romance that ada is probably seeking and knows that she can't really have until she meets harvey keitel but also sort of like the dangers of like living in such a fanciful like in the world that she is not only unprepared to deal with like the actualities or and the brutalities of a patriarchal society but she also does not really prepare her daughter for what all of this means which is why when her daughter betrays her because her daughter has no conception of like what it means to live like not in a romance but in like a real life marriage in this historical period then everything goes terribly wrong Like, the one thing that I kept coming back to as, like, one of the things I found a little bit not believable about this movie is that it, I didn't really believe that, like, a real-life Sam Neill character wouldn't just rape his wife instead of being like, hey, why aren't we having sex? Well, and he almost does. I want sex from you. He almost does twice. But the fact that he, like, never, like, actually go through it, goes through with it, not that I actually want to see that. Um, I was like, we are clearly, like, in the genre of, like, melodrama and not in the genre of realism. Well, and I think one of the most striking images of the film, for me, is the first time that he attempts to rape her, which yes, that is scene. when she is grabbing onto a like tree and he has her almost horizontal pulled back by the large black dress with the hoop skirt that we've already talked about that she is wearing the entire film that really is what that's what stops her from getting away is the constricting garments of her time that uh trap her in this relationship Yes, and the whole thing is set right outside of Harvey Keitel's character's shack, right? Like, Sam Neill's character, Alistair, lives in a proper house, but uh, Harvey Keitel's character, who has quote-unquote gone native, lives in a shack, like, in the middle of the woods. It's this, like, very, like, tropical, verdant-looking thing. And um, Ada is, is setting out to see him, But the thing that, like, I couldn't stop staring at is that there were all of these vines or roots that were, like, I don't know, like, three feet from the ground. And so they just sort of look like curly cues, like, in the forest made out of plants. And she's grabbing at them in order to not be raped. And it's an incredible image that, like, both speaks to, like, the harsh landscape of this area that is amid colonization, And also, like, the weird, dark, fantastical nature of her plight. It's, this movie, as, like, strong as it is, it would be nowhere near as strong without, like, the crazy New Zealand landscape of all of this. And so much about it was Jane Campion trying to think through how, like, unbelievable, like, her ancestors who colonized New Zealand must have found uh, this landscape. And I, yeah, it's... It's like a fairy tale. Yes. Well, and in like a classical version of a fairy tale that's like ominous and scary, but also like exciting. Yes. And I think uh, we are really used to these like cinematic stories about like the American West and the colonization thereof. And to see it transposed uh, into this other context, I think was 
so jarring and yet so beautiful and so effective. On a completely different note, I feel like film Twitter is always going on about how... I love a sentence that starts with, I feel like film Twitter. Shut up. How sex has disappeared from the movies, from mainstream movies especially. And uh, while that's certainly true, what I found really notable about uh, all of the sex scenes, other than the fact that there was sex, um, was like how like not like jacked these actors were. Does that make sense to you? I was like, these are like definitely like 1983 bodies and not like 2021 steroided out your ass bodies. Oh, totally. And I mean, and yet, I have to repeat, Harvey Keitel looked hot as shit. But like, <laughs> it was it was also striking seeing, because really the only like bodies that we see are Holly Hunter's, uh, Harvey Keitel's, and then we see part of Sam Neill's body as she like tries to get intimate with him, which is a really weird thing that I kind of want to talk about too, because she and Harvey Keitel lay naked together multiple times and are able to share each other wholly in a way that it seems like Sam Neill is desperate for, but when she tries to give him that intimacy in some way, he doesn't know how to handle it because he's, I guess probably it's like, cause he's not in charge. There's one yeah. point where she's, I was like, just yeah. think about how the heterosexuals act, Daniel. You're very right. I guess I don't think enough about heterosexuality unless it's the TV show. You, um, <laughs> But perfect show, perfect show, 10 out of 10 um, would kill again. Um, <laughs> and I guess also it's even funnier now that we say like the heterosexuality of it, that like the intimacy that she is trying to impart to Sam Neill is like her, tra- like he is laying on his stomach and she is trying to pull his trousers off and like is touching his butt. And yes, he is, by the way, his very hairless butt. Oh, yeah. Oh, he and Harvey Keitel had no hair on their bodies. It was very <laughs> weird. I guess Samuel had some nipple hair, but uh, we don't need to get into that. Um, but like, he's he seemed terrified of her touching his butt in any way because straight guys hate butt stuff. Um, can confirm. Anyway, <laughs> I, so I guess like talking it through with you right now, I immediately understand the. Uh, He's not in control, and so that's the problem. And part of why Holly Hunter really embraces and finds that she wants to run back to Harvey Keitel's intimacy is that she has as much power as he does in that bedroom in a way that she never does in hers with Sam Neill. And even look at the second time that he attempts to rape her when she is asleep after he has cut her finger off. And he starts, yeah. like, he can see that she is, or th- is convinced that she is asleep, and so starts to, like, unbuckle his belt and is about to penetrate her when she opens her eyes and he immediately backs off. Because, like, there's just something about her being awake that exerts control. Or not exerts control, but, like, undermines his control. Yes. He clearly, like, comes from this vantage point that, like, sex is a man doing things to a woman and therefore like the fact that like she might be interested in touching him might be interested in penetrating him sexually just like cannot compute and so uh let's look at the scene where harvey Keitel is under holly hunter's skirt and sam neal is peering in and a dog starts licking his hand (laughs) that was quite the scene I will say, like, it's, I don't want to give the people of, like, 1983, like, too much, too short a shrift. But on the other hand, like, for a movie from almost 30 years ago, this seems like an an unbelievable amount of, not sex, but, like, sexual nuance and, like, different power dynamics within different couplings, right? Yeah, I was very impressed and surprised. One thing that I did like, uh, partially because like it didn't ever go too deep into any of it, but it was just like there to fill out the world is the people living in the house with them, the aunt and the maid or whomever she is. And all of the other people who seem to like actually exist in this world when they all come together for the Bluebeard play as well, that um, 
it feels like such a small story because it is just about these like three or four characters, but there is this larger life going on there. You know what I really love about the supporting characters? I really love that like they offered this like very fun contrast to Ada and Flora because there's like one main aunt or like, Morag. One Morag, by the way, amazing name. And Morag has a sort of, like, a daughter or, like, a niece or something. Nessie. She always has, like, the follow-up line to her aunt. Yes, like, whenever the aunt or whoever, whenever Morag says a thing, like, there's a helper character who is, like, saying the same words that, like, Morag is saying. And this is, like, a weird, like, doubling of the sentences. And I think it sort of speaks to... Like, Morag is, like, essentially the voice of, like, a kind of, like, scolding femininity, right? Like, she's, like, the voice of the rules. They're reinforcing Sam Neill's expectations. Yes. Sam Neill's, like, extremely patriarchal expectations. And so there's this idea that, like, everyone knows the rules because, like, the rules are so obvious that, like, two people can say the same sentence, like, outlining what the rules are. And it's just this, like, very, like, funny doubling of Ada and Flora, who, like, don't have that type of relationship, and uh, emphasizes their independence um, in, I think, like, a really funny way. Like, I just found, like, the uh, ending the sentences together thing, like, really funny. And I think the humor stuck out more because it's not really, like, a super funny film. And then, like, the type of humor is so weird because it's not, like, a weird little wisecrack. It's just, like, this, like, weird mannerism that, like, has a story purpose. And yet it's just, like, very funny to see. Yeah. And then, I mean, I think that Nessie is a, like, straight-up comic character because there's one point where they're, like, outside and somebody's, like, is that some, is some, is something there? And she immediately screams before she even knows what it is. And it turns out it's just a pigeon. But, like, yes. that's kind of who she <laughs> is. But it speaks to, like, the female simplicity that these women inhabit and the expectations of female simplicity that Alistair has of Ada because he even talks to Morag and Nessie about like how peculiar it is that she is playing the piano on a kitchen table and that like the aunt can't conceptualize the desire for music or the desire for creativity herself and so she finds it so peculiar that Holly Hunter does. I think she says something at one point about how, like, she doesn't like Ada's music because it goes through her. Where Nessie's playing is, like, much more direct, and you assume that it's, like, something much more traditional, like, with, like, a melody and, like, accompaniment. Right, it'd be, like, a hymn or something. Yeah, whereas I think one thing that's, like, really striking about the music in the piano is that it's all like very mood pieces it doesn't really sound like classical music of that period it sounds much more like actually kind of like film music but on but like the point i'm trying to get at is that it's just these like clouds of sound it sounds like feeling yeah it's not like a song song it's mood right because for all that holly hunter does a brilliant job acting in this movie especially as a silent character who only performs with sign language and the expressiveness of her, her face eyes we really only get her emotion through her piano playing that's where the feeling comes out that's where her joy comes out that's why harvey Keitel's character fa- fell for her it seems on the beach because he saw her happiness but also you can hear the twinges of melancholy and longing in her playing as well and i'm sure that's very unsettling for these women who think that, like, they've figured out the simplicity of life because they can't imagine the freedom that Holly Hunter longs for. By the way, you told me that Holly Hunter played most of the piano in the piano, and that fucking blew my mind. Yeah, I was reading that online. She apparently has been playing piano since nine years old, and so much of the piano playing that she does is her own. And I actually looked that up simply because like there were shots of her like actually playing the piano and then like pans up from her hands to her face. So it's it I was like is this uh are they just like putting in a different score or is she actually playing it? And it turns out she is. I'd be curious your thoughts about that as a piano player yourself. I mean, it's very good playing, but like one thing that I kept encountering while reading about the piano 
is that Holly Hunter was incredibly persistent in trying to get this role. And so, like, number one was being cast, right? Like, Jane Campion's first choice for the role was Sigourney Weaver, who, by the way, physically looks nothing like Holly Hunter. Also, would have, like, <laughs> towered over Sam Neill? Yes, Jane Campion apparently wanted someone tall, strong, dark, and physically prepossessing. And she met with Isabel Huber for the role. She met, um, oh, she met with Jennifer Jason Lee, who couldn't do it. Ugh, Sigourney Weaver. Love Jennifer Jason Lee. It would have been like a very interesting movie. Yeah, and she's actually the only one that I could think of, that I could picture this movie being with. With that intensity. Yes. But anyway, you were saying about Holly Hunter and her like desperate work for the role. Yeah, so apparently Campion was like, you know what, you want the role so badly, like, I will let you audition. Part of that audition was, like, Holly Hunter sending her a 30-minute video of herself playing the piano. And then, on top of, like, all of this, after she got the role, she, like, the word I saw was accosted Michael Nyman, the film's composer, Because she was like, I have to convince you that, like, I have to play the piano in the piano. She, like, forced him into a showroom at, like, the Steinway store to be like, this is, like, how well I play the piano. I fucking love Holly Hunter. She is the goat. That, that is so amazing. I love that. I know. (laughs) She's one of my favorites, and that makes me even happier. Um, we should talk about stuff that is, like not the best about this I, I was just about to say we should talk about Anna Paquin <laughs> I watched this movie uh, look we have to say this was like her very first role yeah she literally got cast from like a casting call I found her kind of annoying I did too I was really frustrated by her she was just so grating but I will say watching it a second time I developed a bit more of an appreciation for her just as like an actress. I think that she played this annoying character so well and really inhabited the role in a way that like a lot of child actors can't do. And you see, I feel like in child acting so often you see the seams, you see them trying. And so much of this was like her actually inhabiting this annoying child as opposed yeah. to as opposed to like acting as this child yes i absolutely know what you mean there's like a seamlessness to the performance that's quite amazing that said uh, i don't know children are annoying and i don't think and i think like this child also is written so much as a kind of like an appendage and like a plot device to get Samuel to like where he needs to go and sort of about like that rupture between like the mother and daughter because like the mother has found a kind of eroticism in her life that like obviously the child is not going to be a part of and therefore their like island of like mother daughteriness is sort of like it's split and so like the daughter sort of starts like gravitating more toward like the rest of the family like I think all of that really works I just, like, found it a little bit annoying. Did she deserve Best Supporting Actress? Who were the other... It was uh, Emma Thompson in In the Name of the Father. Okay. Winona Ryder in The Age of Innocence. Rosie Perez in Fearless. And, in the firm, Holly Hunter. What? Yep. Wow. Yeah. So Anna Paquin beat out Holly Hunter for a Oscar. Yes. While I feel like this also be... winning an Oscar herself. Yes, but that this should be like a far bigger part of like the piano lore. Anyway, I just think it's very funny that like Holly Hunter was also nominated. And it's great that Holly Hunter was nominated in both for that, for that year. But um, just wild. Though, I mean, in some ways, I get it. (laughs) Um, I think there is like an obligatory conversation that we need to have about Jane Campion and about this movie. I will start by saying I have no way to prove this. And so this is just like my impression. But as like generally removed as 
Jane Campion is from sort of like mainstream Hollywood filmmaking, I do feel like she's been a really big influence. I think Hollywood has taken up these stories about like arranged marriages gone wrong and especially about like stifled female creativity and how when it is repressed, um, it comes out in these like really terrible ways and like is... Uh, mentally punishing for the women who can't express themselves. And I do think that that is like a big part of like the piano's legacy. I also think if that is true, like another part of that legacy is probably like the (laughs) extreme white feminism of this movie. Um, So much of, like, this movie is about not just Ada's specialness from the other, like, white women, but also, like, from the brown women. I thought it was quite interesting and maybe not entirely convincing about, like, the white man who, quote-unquote, goes native and, like, has Maori face tattoos, does not sleep with, like, any of the brown women. Like, he's, like, much more interested in the special white woman. Yes. And like the fact that, like, even the brown women are like, oh, you you have, like, the skin of an angel. I was like, ugh, okay. Like, in the same, like, sentence or, like, in the same breath that they are talking about, like, how pale she is. And I was like, that's, like, an, an its own little story that, like, I would be interested in that, like, obviously Jane Campion is not uh delving into and so so much of her like creativity in itself and like her like all of the things that like i discussed already like her will to carve out a sort of like sanctum for herself and her daughter and like obviously like the luxuriousness of the piano all of those are like very much coded as white and so i think her specialness is sort of uh indivisible from her whiteness and this movie has come under fire from some parts of the New Zealand public for, like, sort of playing into, like, colonial narratives. And I think that that's, like, a thing that we have to acknowledge. Yeah, I think that's a very fair criticism. It's striking that there is no character with a name that is Maori. That uh, there is no... Is that really true? Yeah. Oof. I mean, maybe they have names in the credits, but there's no character that is, like, given any sort of characterization that is Maori. Um, The closest we get is Harvey Keitel's character, which I will say, when we first started watching the movie, I was nervous that he was supposed to be Maori. I thought he was maybe, like, half Maori. Mm Mm-hmm. Was, like, initially my fear. (laughs) Yeah. The one moment that I felt, not that Campion was getting at anything specific here, but that I did look and say, huh, was when the old guy was with the axe was trying to like demonstrate the shadow puppet axe chopping um, and ask Nessie to do it. And when Nessie's like, oh, no, I'm busy, I'm busy, he asks the Maori woman who's sitting in the house, like doing some housework uh, to get up and do it. And as soon as like the that woman gets up, Nessie like pushes her out of the way and is like, okay, I'll do it. Never mind. Yeah. Like the movie is extremely not blind to the stratification in the society. There's also like a scene where a group of Maori uh, women, or I think it's women, like she's like a caretaker, and then children are in the woods and the children are sort of like making out with the trees. Yeah, they're playing games with the trees. Yeah. And basically Samuel's character comes over at some point and like rips floor away and like there's like a very strict like you are not supposed to act like these quote-unquote savages and he is he's also kind of like you're disrespecting the trees or something i don't think it's in any way a accident that samuel's terrible character is a land speculator or whatever like a person who is like buying up land and in the same way that like he doesn't understand ada uh, he does not understand, like, why the Maori think that certain land is sacred and, like, certain lands are not to be sold. And there is this sort of, like, analogizing that the film is doing between Sam Neill's character's, uh, like, violence toward his wife and his 
violence toward the land and like toward New Zealand in general. Um, but we can also talk about sort of like the problematicness of conflating those two things, but that's obviously what the film itself is doing. Well, I also think that um, Campion's trying to highlight the stark difference between the Western and Maori native understanding of land and that like Sam Neill's character, Alistair has a line where he basically says like, I don't understand why these people aren't raising their, this land and like deforesting it, cultivating it as opposed to understanding that like they have a different approach to cultivating their land and that they maybe have a better relationship with their land because they they have learned and developed with it as opposed to trying to make it look like what they imagine it should be whether the, likely a much more like european looking landscape yes and so like all of that is supposed to be like very analogizable to his marriage right jane campion like one of the films that she made in while she was in film school it's called Mishaps, Seductions, and Conquests, and it's basically an alternation between, like, a guy who is trucking up Mount Everest and then, like, his brother who is trying to, like, sleep with a woman. Oh, yeah, of course. Women are uh, mountains to conquer. <laughs> Obviously, there's, like, a lot there in terms of, like, how uh, the male imagination sort of, like, feminizes these landscapes, but at the same time, there is sort of this, like, risk of, like, doing sort of, like, a one-for-one. One. And so... Again, uh, I don't think we have to go into this like super hard, but I did feel like if we didn't acknowledge it, we would not be doing our due diligence. Of course. Let's talk about the ending. Well, so at first, I thought that the ending really was that, that Ada was going to drown along with her piano and just leave her daughter to Harvey Keitel to go off into the go back to England. I'm glad that it didn't happen that way, but I would have also been really satisfied with that ending. So Jane Campion said in a 2013 interview that, like, looking back on the film, I guess 20 years later, um, she wishes she had just killed Ada, and she sort of felt like she had to provide, like, a happier ending, like, at the time. Um, and so that was the one that she went with. Um, but now she thinks it's much more realistic that Ada would have committed suicide and stayed dead in New Zealand. I have to say, I love the ending where she is not dead. I, I did too, honestly. <laughs> I, I really did. For all that I would have totally vibed with the suicide, I did love that like Ada's peculiarity persisted. Yes. I love the fact that like they sort of like rejoined... I don't know if it's, like, an English society or, like, a New Zealand town or whatever. I love that she ended up with this, like, fucking metal finger, which looks very metal, by the way. I love that, like, with Harvey Keitel's character's uh, face tattoos and her, like, nine fingers, they were, like, basically the town freaks, but they were, like, so gifted that, like, they made money anyway by like her by giving piano lessons him i'm sure doing all sorts of harvey Keitel things they were basically just like the town freaks and she was able to sort of like fit that sort of like middle class upper class like all of the gifts that she had and was able to sort of like impart it a little bit to like the rest of society and that she was able to sort of like have her creativity and her and a marriage too. And also like this child out of wedlock. Like I love the fact that like she was able to have it all. Sorry, I'm a little lemon apologist. Now and wow, forever. Wow, all about Tina Fey. But um, <laughs> I agree with you. And I think it also, okay, Jane Campion said in 2013 that she wished that she had let Ada die. But it's really satisfying that she doesn't, that... Ada doesn't let Alistair win. Yes. That her will is stronger than that. She is stronger than the man who tried to break her. I think that's sort of like in probably like in our yours and my feminist fantasies. Like that is like the sort of like story that we want. That is like the fable that we want. 
I I thought like all of the repeated references of like the piano to a coffin. I think I thought were like really interesting. But it is like, of course, like in a way, like it did end up being a coffin because it was like the death of like all of her dysfunctions and like all of her previous iterations of herself. And she was fine. Like shedding the piano was also her final step to freedom. After letting that piano die, she is able to get a new finger. She's able to start practicing to talk again which is something she hasn't done since she was six. And so there's this, like, for all that the piano was her life raft for so long, it became her burden by the end, and she had to get rid of it to be able to, like, actually continue living. Yeah, or she was able to, like, find more than a life raft. She was able to, like, find Find something bigger. Yeah. I don't think it's, like, in any way a coincidence that, like, she spends most of the movie wearing black, and then by the end, she's in this, like, really beautiful embroidered dress. Like, she's to find the, like, flowering. My one thing is that if you're gonna replace your finger with a metal finger, you should maybe get, like, a leather sheath to put on it, put on it so you don't get the banging. I had that exact same thought. The other thing that, like, bugged me the entire time is, like, where is her sheet music? She doesn't need any. She's a genius. Nobody is that much of a genius. Sorry, Ada. <laughs> Sorry, Holly Hunter. <laughs> well, so that was the piano. <laughs> uh, what a great conversation this was. I'm so glad we watched this movie. I'm, I'm thrilled to be starting this series. I said this yesterday that I was really worried that whatever we did after Almodovar wouldn't live up to what like still to me is going to probably be my favorite director for the rest of my life. And those movies were life changing in a way that I don't know if any other films will impact me as much, but like it was so exhilarating, thrilling to like watch something so beautiful and so good that like I felt like yes I can I can do this I can watch these other things and just great choice I'm really excited to keep doing Campion yeah I I think that there is just sort of this like primevalness that like this movie really gets at that I don't know if like we'll sort of like get there again with Campion but we'll see yeah so at the end of every episode of All About Almodovar, we ranked the movies that we saw. Uh, Daniel, how does <laughs> the pian- like where does the piano rank among all of the Campion movies you've seen? I would say of all the films of Jane Campion, for me, it ranks number one right now. <laughs> Excellent. How about you? For me as well. All right, that's about it for this week's episode. Thank you so much for joining us, and we hope you continue listening as we explore the rest of Campion's filmography. Our next episode will be out next Thursday, October 28th, where we will be discussing 2009's Bright Star. You can email us at allaboutfilmpod at gmail.com, or you can look us both up on Twitter. I'm Ingo Kang. I'm Daniel Schrader. Talk to you next time. <laughs>